the way that Alec McLeish is built is um, he loves a challenge. When you got offered a big club like Aston Villa, then yeah, that's a hard one to turn down. People say, do you regret going now? And I say, no, I think I would have regretted not giving it a crack. With the parameters, I thought, well, I'm not going to see a bonus for a couple of years. I really did. I really did feel that. <laughs> first thing I said to him was, I don't have to spend money if, if I can get you right in, into our team, son. At that moment, Jack was getting, we felt that people were getting in contact with him to leave Villa. Unfortunately, you don't get it right all the time, but I've been successful more than I've failed. When your own crowd goes against you, it's, it's one of the most horrible feelings in the world. Um, I hope this is all right for me, me be talking about this. I'm going to kick off by taking you on a, on a trip down memory lane. I can't believe that it's been, we're talking eight or nine, nine years now since, since your time at Villa. Can we start at the beginning by kind of just, just reminiscing about the first time you knew that, that Aston Villa were interested in making you manager? You know, when I left uh, Birmingham City, it was a wee bit of a wrench yeah, because I had a really good uh, time there. We, we just couldn't sustain the resources in terms of, you know, trying to stay in with the big guns. We were a wee bit unlucky in the, in the last part of the season where we, we lost a few of the, the, the main strikers, the, the two guys that actually scored the goals in, in the uh, Carling Cup final. Anyway, you know, time moves on and um, when you got offered a position such as a big club like Aston Villa, then yeah, that's a hard one to turn down. To the un- uninitiated, how does that come about then? How does it, does, is there a call through an agent or what? what's the process like? Yeah, well, they, they get in touch with agents and, you know, that's that's the way the world works and has worked. As you, you rightly say, it's a few years ago, right enough, but uh, quit the blues, I handed my resignation and uh, I felt that, you know, that there was... I couldn't take them any further, you know, we we, we, we tried to uh, get more resources in terms of um, improving every year, but at the time, the money is not quite, wasn't quite there, which is now in the Premier League and, and how, you know, but, so, you know, I left, you, you know, not, I wouldn't say under a cloud, I really enjoyed the club and, you know, within days, there was, there was a contact through the, the agent and he, he told me about Villa's interest. So the first time that, that you you know Villa are interested, what, what's the thir- first thing that goes through your head? Is it the fact there's an opportunity to get back into football quickly, back in the Premier League? Or is it, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to, I know it's quite, not quite the same, but I'm going to have to do the equivalent of going across the old firm Dar- Derby lines? Well, well, actually, you, you know, you... you you beat me to it there because uh, I was going to say that um, I thought you know it was nothing quite like Rangers or Celtic, but when <laughs> when I across the the city, then uh, I found out about the rivalry um, between the two clubs, and you know it was it, it's pre- pretty baiting to be honest. And um, you know I, d- I didn't think <laughs> I would receive. Uh, the, the reception that I got but at the same time I kind of took it back to when I went to Rangers and you know a journalist his first question was you, you know you not the not the best ever welcome I like because I think Rangers at that time they dick advocate they were trying to win the Champions League to be honest I felt that that was them going down the road where they would just concentrate on top foreign coaches so it was, it was a real surprise to get the call at Rangers. And when, when that press guy asked me that, I said, and I said, well, it's up to me to prove the fans wrong. And I got that kind of little um, feeling when the Aston Villa job came up. I thought, well, how can I turn this this down? You know, I, I, this is, I'll probably regret this. People say, do you regret going now? And I said, no, I think I would have regretted not giving it a crack. Listen, you were a big, rugged kind of centre half by trade. You got big, strong shoulders, and you've you've got a few miles on the clock in terms of football and in terms of life. 
but it still can't be can't be nice when I think there was some graffiti on the. Tr- I told I told you this this wouldn't be be great kind of uplift up, uplifting stuff, didn't it? That it, it can't be nice when there's graffiti on the training ground and there's a couple of hundred fans who are, are gathered outside Villa Park. What what does that feel like, kind of personally on a personal level? Oh, I'm I'm human, you know. Uh, it hurts. Uh, it hurts inside. It hurts uh, in your head. You kind of you know trying to get. A wee bit of kip at nights, and it's tossing, you're tossing and turning. When you wake up in the middle of the night, maybe uh, to have a wee visit to the toilet, and um, then all of a sudden, you know, you're turning it in your head, saying, "Well, have I done the right thing?" Uh, sometimes you feel you don't get the credit you deserve, but do you feel is it because I'm from Birmingham? Do the Villa fans um, think I'm rubbish? Do they, you know? And and again, it was that going back to Rangers and. And get in my head that um, you know what if I can't turn this? And although we I knew the, the parameters in which uh, I was going to work under, I was going to ask you about about those kind of parameters really, because the first time that you m- would have met Randy Lerner and, and, and Paul Fortner, was it laid out to you that that this was going to be a different kind of Villa experience to the one that perhaps Martin O'Neill enjoyed when there was money flowing a bit more readily? Was that was that kind of laid out from day one? Yeah, um, I, I met them after I agreed to join Villa and I met them in London and the, the accountant for the club had um, showed me how we were going to work and um, he had two kind of divisions and he said if you go up in that division and down in that division that will be successful and you can earn bonuses, that kind of thing. I thought, well... Uh, I, with the, the with the parameters, I thought, well, I'm not going to see a bonus for a couple of years. I really did. <laughs> I really did feel that, and and I knew when I walked back to see my wife. My son was with her as well, John, and they saw my face when I went in the door, <laughs> and they said, "You're not getting any money to spend, are you? <laughs> not not one of the bloody ones again, you know." Uh, <laughs> I mean, Jill, Jill could read read me like a book and um, she could see right away that <laughs> it was going to be a difficult season. You you mentioned Jill. What what was her first reaction to the fact that you were leaving one one rival club for another? Well, she kind of backed me in, in all the decisions. I kind of made decisions over the years when I, I was a footballer at Aberdeen then there was some um, English clubs coming for me and I said I would tell Sir Alex that I was going to, going to leave and I bottled it, you know, when I went in to see him in the office. We, in those days, we didn't have agents. Um, and then I went out and I told Jill, she says, well, are we going to London? And I says, well, I think I've just signed on again. And she says, oh, well, whatever, you know, I, you know, you know I'll always back you. And, um, but, you know, I, I think she'd seen a part of my uh, Rangers career when things weren't going so well and, Obviously, there was a downsizing of of money and funds uh, at Ibro- Ibrox, and you know I had to get rid of a, a lot of really good players, and be, because we had to, you know, cut the the wage bill, and she saw the turmoil I went through in that um, job, and that's why you know she when she saw my face, she says. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty tough season for us and uh, batting the hatches, and, and you can only you can only do your best. It's a bit of a strange question to ask, but again, we love to be a fly on the wall in these situations. What what's the experience like when you meet? When what what was it like when you met Randy Lerner for the for the first time? I mean, this is this is me getting into really stupid detail, but I presume they pick up the tab and do you know you're allowed to have a pint, or is it all got to be very above board with a, a cup of coffee? Or how 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 do these things work? Yeah, you know, I'm, I met Randy and Paul. We met in Randy's house, and yeah, it was just um, you know cakes and biscuits and a cup of tea but there were, there were a lot of people in his house he had a few lawyers and that, that and as well so you know it's he's a he's obviously a, a businessman as well so there was probably other things going on they gathered together you know like Randy the accountant and I and um, got the parameters correct and uh, I thought right okay I'm not going to say I don't want the job I would I would have t- taken it, whatever happened. But I knew 
well, you know, can, can I turn this? And um, have we got the players? Have we got the resources? And I thought, well, you know, I gave myself that challenge that I, that I, I did when I was in Glasgow. You talk about resources. I think I'm right in thinking that Ashley Young and Stuart Downing were pretty much out of the door before you'd even got, got your feet feet under the table. Is that right? Did you even get to, to meet those guys and to, to train with those guys? Well, I think Ashley was a done deal. Ashley was a done deal, um, which which was um, a blow. Uh, he was already gone. Um, and Stuart Downing was in the throes of, of the Liverpool move. I did speak to Stuart. I tried to, to keep Stuart and persuade him, you know, that he was going to be a key player in Aston Villa's season and uh, and one of the most or the most experienced players despite he was still quite a young guy at the time but um, he he obviously wasn't going to turn that Liverpool move down and Aston Villa certainly uh, didn't want to turn the money down so that was key in, in the whole thing so that, so that was a blow right away He's losing Stuart, I think 20 million or something the fee was. And uh, I, I was hoping I could get some of that. I was just going to talk on, on the topic of, of, of transfers that, that you were able to make. I'll just go, just go through through them. Um, it was Shay Given was your, your first one, I think, wasn't it? Can I can I run a rumour by you regarding Shay Given and whether this is true or whether this is just urban myth? I heard that he got the nickname, Take That, because Villa had funded his signing or funded his wages through having take that play at Villa Park a couple of nights. Is that is there anything is there anything true in that? Well, I, I've not got a Scooby Doo about that one. Uh, um, I certainly don't know anything about that. That's uh, I, I remember take that being at Villa Park, but to, to fund it, I'm not sure. But in saying that, the you know uh, doing the, the Downing deal would have given them the opportunity to do one or two other things. I think it was covering. Uh, she's wages only. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we paid a fee. Or, I can't remember. Can you? Do you get the facts of that one? I'm not sure. I think he might have. I think he might have been available on a free. Because I think Joe Hart was 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 the main man at, at Man City. Um, so in terms of the reason for getting Shay, was it just kind of somebody who, who got a bit of nous and a bit of experience? Yeah, yeah. He, he was a very um, capable goalkeeper, a great reader of the game and penalty box. So, so he wasn't a six feet four like you know some of the the guys that are playing in the Premier League, the Chelsea goalies and Real Madrid. But uh, you, you know, as a goalkeeper, fantastic leader as well, and it was a pleasure to work with him. Uh, not not it didn't go smoothly the whole season, not just for me but she as well when he broke his collarbone and we lost him for a. For a right few weeks, the most it was a kind of random kit launch and, and unveiling, wasn't it? Down at um, the local casino, I remember remember Shay being unveiled as he came down an, an escalator or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was. Um, I, I remember that in the casino. Yeah, the, the launch of the kits. Couldn't remember that that was actually his his um, introduction, but obviously the press were there, so it was a good time to do it and. Coming down the, the escalator seems like something out of Hollywood, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. Rather, rather than in a city, Birmingham, it does. It does sound a little bit more um, rock and roll. I tell you, who I'd like to get get some insight from from you about Charles and Zogbia because he, to me, he's kind of so much so much talent bundled up into yeah. his football boots, but just trying to trying to, to make him tick. Am I am I right in thinking that you tried to get him for Blues initially? Yeah, we we, we did. We looked something for Blues and. Probably we could have gone a lot, a lot cheaper, but because of the downing deal being so big, then we had to pay about nine million for Charles. And, you know, looking at it and seeing Stuart Downing going and then bringing Charles in and thinking Charles kind of, you know, it would be unfair to say single handedly kept Wigan up the season before, but he came really good for them in those um, last three or four weeks. And you see the talent of the guy then. It was, it was, um, you know, for me one of the, the the top ones that we could try and bring in at that particular moment, and and, and price wise also, um, you know, a really exciting player on his day. But you know, sometimes when you when you come in to a club and an atmosphere, maybe that when 
you know, you know, there's a, they've lost a lot of players. They, you're bringing a lot of young players through, um, and you know there has to has to be a little bit of give and take. Then it, you know it's unfair to put the pressure on one guy. And Charles, like all footballers in the world, don't don't have all the answers until they get to probably the later years of their careers. If did some good things in in um, some moments, but uh, as you know, probably never got enough out of the guy who had a really good talent. What kind of character was he, Alex? Well, he quiet, quiet guy. You know, he, he wasn't um, loud or anything, and he was quiet. And, it, and he wasn't one of these guys who who shouted all the time or talked much on the field. He tended to. You know, try to make his talent doing the talking. You know, in, in certain moments he did it, but um, you know, it was it was tough for for a lot of the players in that kind of particular season. Um, although we we had our own problems, you know, we, with a lot of the injuries and and we had to take loan players and also bringing through a lot of the youngsters. You know, I had to to uh, two or three years later after I left, uh, I. Had I had a, a, a wee chuckle in, in terms of the commentator saying, oh, Villa bringing through all the young ones, you know. I mean, I have got about a dozen young players that came through in that particular season. And, you know, getting getting Grealish to sign a game was also uh, something that hopefully Villa fans will now appreciate. I was going to come back to you on Grealish in a moment, but what I was going to say about, about your signings was, I remember, I think it was deadline day in the August, and I think you signed two people from Tottenham, Alan Hutton uh, on a permanent deal and Jermaine Genus on loan. It couldn't have been any more different in terms of the length of their Villa careers, could it? You know, what, what, was, your, what was your feelings about um, Genus? Because that, that was a blow, wasn't it? Was he injured in his second or third game? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, Jermaine had some previous injuries and and uh, we never really got him at, at the the top level Jermaine was, was at, you know, and, and could have been at. And uh, mm. getting an early injury was also a blow. And these these are risks sometimes when you take on. We did, we did all the medicals, you know, we had a, a great medical team in there, Ian McGuinness, um, who worked with Mate Rangers, had um, formed a great team. And, and Ian, Ian's a very thorough guy. And, it's just a pity that we, we couldn't get Jermaine at his, at his um, absolute best. And the other one, Alan Hutton, is it, did it surprise you after you left Villa, his durability in a way? Because I think he, I think he, it looked like he'd been written off by a couple of managers and then he came roaring back and eventually kind of won the fans back over as well. Is that something that, that doesn't surprise you because you know what kind of character he is? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you have to say, that what he did come through shows amazing mental toughness because um, the first season was hard for him. Uh, it's an Alec McLeish signing. People weren't accepting, unless I'd brought in Ronaldo or something, then, <laughs> um, you know, there was going to be a bit of criticism and underwhelming kind of signings in their book. But Hutton, I knew what he, what he could do, what he'd done at Rangers. He had a magnificent um, year for Scotland. It, it was a good deal. It was a great deal we got that one because we traded him almost for Luke Young. Luke was having having hip problems, but we got the same money um, in for Luke as we paid for Alan. Fair play, to Alan Hutton, and uh, it, as I said, that toughness that he showed to come through that and to then become a cult figure with Aston Villa fans. The man who I think probably represents your best transfer at Villa, and he was only there a very short time, but provided a real kind of short, sharp shock that the, the club needed at that time, was Robbie yeah, Keane. Robbie. What, what was your experience of, of, of the... I think he was only there for perhaps a, a couple of months under you, Alex, but what what was your experience of, of working with Robbie at Villa? He, he was superb. Um, uh, it had been great to have worked. You, you know, come on, let's face it, Mark. If, if uh, we had the players like... Robbie at that level and we didn't have to ask the young too many youngsters to go into the team and into a team of Villa stature um, too early 
and and uh, but you know a lot of them come through the other end um, successfully and are still playing and doing well. Uh, but guys like Robbie Keane, you know, you 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 pick players at that level, then you know that they are not going to fail. And um, Keane came in and was an instant success. His finishing, his technique, uh, everything he done was just another level. And you know, great to work with Robbie, and so sad to see him see him leaving to go back to the MLS at the time. And, and in fact, the day the, the last game I think was it up at Blackburn, and at that same day, uh, Darren Darren Bent got injured. And he missed the rest of the season as well. So we lost two fantastic strikers. Darren at that time was, I think, on nine goals. And normally he would he would come in with about 15 or 16, which would definitely have seen us higher up the table. You know, it was getting a bit touchy towards the end. Um, we had we had some um, real setbacks in terms of losing still into to illness and he, he was the most experienced player we had in the midfield and, you know, bringing youngsters in to play around about him was, um, the, you know, also a great learning curve for these guys as well. My remit really was um, trying to get up the, the, the table in terms of the league positions, but go down the table in terms of reducing wages. And uh, <laughs> if you stay in the Premier League, then... Probably I deserve to stay, but it was a bit uh, difficult for me in terms of emotions. And one of the things for a football manager is is that he can please the fans, you know. But it's very difficult, and you, you don't have that relationship. When when things are no no going well at a club, or you know, there's a downturn, you often find that um, injuries kind of manifest themselves, you know, and you end up with uh, a lot of your key players out of commission. I um, We've spoken to, to uh, not, not recently, but it, since you've left the club, we've spoken to Paul Montgomery, who, who I knew, know was um, a big scout for you, or possibly a chief scout back at the time at Villa. And yeah. the, the wish list that you'd got back then, you, you kind of made made some kind of tentative approaches for some, some cracking players, didn't you? Oof, we... we... We, we had a war room, uh, we called it the war room, and Paul and Peter Grant, myself, we constantly put players' names on, on the walls of this little room. When I, when I arrived at Villa, there wasn't a database of players, and we that was one of the things we strived to do, was to put as many names in the laptops, in the computer system that, uh, as, that, that we could. And, you know, at the end of the day, guys like Ben Teke were in there, and... Uh, Arthur Newman had gone to see Benteke and yeah, he he liked him. He liked what he saw. He thought he could. He said he, he thought he could get in the box a bit more. And he'd been Arthur watched him in games and he said he was coming. He came coming to the ball too much, but because in European uh, football, Zigic was like that as well at Birmingham uh, when he first came and he said I like to come to the box. He says you just get in the box, big man. You know. <laughs> And uh, we we kind of we we kind of thought that about Ben Tech as well. But he came and he scored about sixteen or seventeen goals. God, you imagine if one of my players had done that in my year at Villa, then we'd we'd probably been about four or five places up the league. I'm not sure Villa really came clean publicly at that time. I think Villa still tried to kind of maintain this idea that. Yeah, we've been kicking around the top top six, top ten for the last few years. Nobody ever came out and said, actually, the job we've asked Alex to do is to just get, get Villa to survive. So I'm just kind of, there must have been a, a strange vibe around the place. Listen, you know, you know you, when you care about something, and I, I've cared all my life about football and any jobs that I've, I've, I've done, and uh, sometimes, you know, it creates a wee bit of anxiety, you know, and uh, you know, as I said, you're only human, and uh, you, you you know you're kind of driving up, even driving up to the, the stadium and times match days. You always had uh, some really lovely people wait for you to say hello and do a photo, while, like that kind of thing. And uh, that that kind of calms calms you, you know. But you just go and try and get the best out of the players that you have at your disposal. Maybe you know, as I said, um, 
we had a lot. We introduced a lot of young players into that team. You know, Sammy and Carruthers, um, I think, played up at Liverpool. And if my memory serves me right, Andy Vyman gets two goals in two games. You know, I won like, four points. We get out of of the six. I think it was Stoke and the winner against Fulham. And you know, boys like Daniel Johnson, Nathan Baker, Chris Heard, all these young fellas, Delfonso, all Brighton was still young. We were trying to. I was trying to um, get Delphi through. The first thing I said to him was, I, I don't have to spend money if, if I can get you right in, into our team, son. And, uh, and he says, oh, it was music to my ears. That was his, his reply the first day I met him at training. You mentioned a young Jack Grealish on the bench for a Premier League match against Chelsea, I think he was, at the age of 16. Obviously, he, he he's done all right for himself since. Tell us what 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 kind of made you invite a young Jack Grealish to, to join the first team group anyway? As well, we, I know from the point of view that the, your options were limited, but what did you see in Jack back then? At that moment, Jack was getting, we felt that people were getting in contact with him to leave Villa. That, that was one of the, the main reasons to get him involved with us as well. Um, but he would have been on the bench anyway because of the casualties we had and he, he was the the best youngster coming through. What was he like? Did he still, did he have that swagger about him even then? Yeah. Um, I, I went to a lot of the, the academy games and uh, even on the day of maybe a home game, the, the boys were playing, you know, just at the side of the training ground and go down there and see Jack for the first time with the, the famous um, socks down his legs. So he, he was doing that at a very early age. Uh, he must have copied one one of the, the top guys. I don't know. Has he ever gave you an explanation for that? Yeah, I think think he does it for superstitious reasons now because he did it once or he and and, and he, he played well. Aye, aye. Yeah, I get that as well. Players are creatures of habit. But yeah, I saw him in the in the in the, the game and he had that swagger. Yeah, absolutely. You know, watching him as a kid, it, it, you know, on the on the field, ghosting past people and. Uh, with the ball at his feet, you know, you could see all day long he, he was going to be going to be a star. No, no doubt about it. Which is why we fought um, pretty well to keep him at the pillar. When we played at Man United, we would heard that he was in um, a, a restaurant, you know, being being courted by you know, you know one of the agents, and uh, you know to try and get him to Man United. So we were obviously a bit alarmed about that and we fought well to, to keep him. And he, but we knew he loved Villa, he's his old man as well. We had the man speaking to them and um, you know, they're lovely people. And and I think, you know, we we they asked for something, the, the club said, oh, that's too much. And then, you know, finally you, you come to an agreement and uh, everybody's happy and Jack... Uh, stayed at Aston Villa, which, which was great to see one of the, the great players of Villa nowadays staying with, with his boyhood heroes. I think you possibly safeguarded 50 million plus for Aston Villa there, because if Manchester United try and come and court him now, probably going to have to buy him a start, starter and a dessert, aren't they, I think? There's no doubt about that, but it's, uh, you know, it's not all, it's not down to me, down to me you know, Graham, uh, the academy... Um, was was it instrumental and and you know and a lot of thanks have to go to him. When he joined in first team training, was he was he not overawed by it either? It's funny. I I kind of when I, I when I went to Aberdeen and I joined in with the first team. Ali McLeod was the manager and he he, he called me over to train with the first team because I played the boy the boys club levels and I was a, a captain. I was shouting all the time and. I, and I found myself joining in and uh, really enjoying it and starting to shout at first team players. And and uh, when Jack came in, I saw that kind of, um, you know, I know, although he wasn't a big shouter, but he, he was uh, definitely a boy who was willing to take the ball in any part of the, 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 the uh, pitch. The guy that I likened him, likened him to at the time was was Barry Ferguson, you know, who could have played in any stadium in the world. Barry was fearless uh, and then taking the ball, just give me the ball, just give me it, you know. And you, you see, um, you see that kind of 
thing and Jack, he's come on absolutely leaps and bounds. Not that he was never going to do that, but you know, hopefully he'll he'll go on to play for England, but hopefully not not play too well against Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you about the Stylian Petrov situation? How that was emotionally and professionally, because you've got, you got a football club to look after at the time, but you've also got the kind of, from a compassionate point of view, you've got, you know, a really great man and his family to take care of. How 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 did you cope with that, Alex? Yeah, well, that was a really difficult time for us. And even Randy Lerner came to the training ground in one of the particular days and uh, after he'd been diagnosed, which was, um, you know, pretty emotional. Still and I had a wee kind of tete a tete half time and I thought, what's up? Then, you know, you, you look off the pace and he says, oh, well, just take me off then. And he was going to come off, but he, you know, he said, look, boss, I, you've got nothing on the bench, not except the young boys. It, it didn't mean nothing in terms of the, the, you know, the way they could play. He says, you don't have the experience. I'll play in the second half. I says, you sure? You know, and uh, he played and, you know, he kind of wasn't the, the stallion that we knew. And after the game, I, I stayed in, in London and Ian McGuinness phoned me and said, look, I think you were right about stallion. He's, he's got a, a temperature and um, I, took, I took his temperature and he, he's probably got a wee dose of the flu. Um, I, I hope this is all right for me maybe talking about this, but... Um, Still, uh, Ian, doc, the doc said to him, we'll see you in Monday. Evan. So I saw him on Monday as well. He's on the bike, uh, warming, you know, the warm down Monday. And uh, I says, I told you, and you know, was there, you know, you, you, you weren't quite yourself. And he says, ah, you're right, boss, you were right. And uh, I was a bit yeah, stubborn. And, you know, on the Tuesday, Ian McGuinness took him for the blood test and they gave us the bad news and then all of a sudden you know football didn't seem important anymore we gathered in the training ground with Randy Lerner a couple of weeks later and Randy knew we were all fighting to stay in the Premier League which is always going to be the case as I said uh, Jill, Jill um, recognised that then you know if, if that's a, a lady my wife recognises when you're you're going to have a hard time and of a season. Then that was the time when we all had to really buckle down, get together. We'd lost a key man in midfield, and it was up to the rest of us to to um, pay tribute to, to Stillian by making sure we stayed in that Premier League. Is that when your kind of management has to come to the fore, Alex, in terms of making sure you do the right thing by by Stillian? But also, kind of, were you the one who had to communicate it to to the lads? Or yeah, yeah, we we did. Uh, we had to um, give them get a lobby meeting and or a big meeting, important meeting. That uh, and we all agreed that we were going to um, work to our maximum to to um, help still in you know, recover as well in terms of the, the, the goodwill that we could we could uh, give to him by doing that. The players were, you know, obviously shocked and, you know, we, we got a kind of good reaction in training. It was quite quiet, but, you know, everybody was was um, working as if they'd never worked before. There was a press conference at Bodymore. I think me, me and Neil Moxley, uh, Mox from the Daily Mail were, I think we were probably giving you a bit of a hard time because of the results, you know, had gone a little bit flat. And you just, you sat there like you normally did and you just took it. You were very polite, very respectful, answered all of our questions and just kind of took it all on your shoulders. 20 minutes later, you came back in to announce this news about Stan. And I just thought, and I'm not just kind of blowing smoke now, but I just thought for you to just front up that and to kind of, do you know what I mean? To to answer that and be very polite and not snap at us when you knew what what kind of week yourself and Stylian Petrov and the football club had had. I just thought that I thought that you, you you emerged from that with with, with really great credit. Oh, thank you. Um, I, when you come through football as a as a young manager, you know you kind of um, you, you know your boundaries in terms of the press. I know that we we 
we all lose the plot and again and have a go um, back and some of it is box office <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but at, th- at that particular moment I thought everybody needs to be calm and let, you know let's hope the press and everybody who are naysayers get behind us and um, that we we stay in the Premier League for Stillian we, we were fighting quite a battle after that and we had some really, really strong performances um, despite the setbacks that we had. It was, it was an amazing topsy-turvy season. And, uh, you know, as I said, I don't think we were, we're ever in the bottom three. But we, we, we'd certainly started quite high in the league. And after a few games, which is which means nothing, that's where you end up. And uh, then we, we kind of slipped down a wee bit. But... You know, I, I don't care what anybody says. If people complain about injuries in the Premier League this season, then there was absolutely nothing compared to what we had at Villa that season. Can I ask you about another kind of strange thing that, that must come your way as a football manager? I think there were a couple of... I suppose this happens at any any football club, but I think you, you you got the incident where a couple of lads had gone out and caused a bit of trouble. Was it, was it Chris Hurd? Um, Big Ginge, James Collins, and and Fabian had cut had some nightclub incident. When when things like that happen, Alex, do you have to kind of be the big kind of serious kind of angry headmaster type? How, how do you deal with those kind of off the field things? Yeah, that was getting really towards the end, um, and it was after a, a club night out. Actually, Boris Johnson is relying on everybody to stay alert these, <laughs> these days, and I'm relying on these players to just enjoy their club night and then go back because we've got a game in three or four days or something. As a manager, you, you think you can trust trust them, but it's a bit like Boris Johnson saying, stay alert, and then 5,000 5, people go down the beach you know, or, go, or go into the public parks or go into the trains and we're all going back to work, you know. And, uh, so... <laughs> It's hard to, to trust Alec Ferguson used to give us a curfew, you know, and we, we broke the curfew and we got the, the hairdryer in the morning. Listen, it was, um, as I said, a very difficult time and we we, did, we dealt with the players who who uh, stepped out of line. But, you know, that's that happens even now. We're, we still see it in the, the British culture. What were you like, Alex? Are you, were you a kind of tracksuit manager? Were you, were you down and amongst it or were you kind of taking more? I, know, I, I like to, uh, you know, listen, I wasn't, a, I, I wasn't a, the, the head coach as such, you know, the, doing the, the, the kind of drills and, uh, you know, I was attended more to, uh, I went to every session, never stayed, stayed in the office, went to every session. And, um, you know, if you, you, you could stand in the sidelines and see if somebody was a little bit slack or, you know, and, or you needed to praise somebody, then, you know, the, it was all these kind of um, leadership traits. And then, of course, when it got to the end of the week, it was about uh, shaping up the 11. Uh, and that was more kind of, you know, my uh, forte. And then actually... The, the, the decisions to pick the right players for a particular game. And you unfortunately, you don't get it right all the time. But, um, you know, I've, I've been successful more than I've failed. What would have been your your best game or your favourite moment? Would it have been going to Chelsea and beating them at New Year? Yeah, that was that was um, the, the highlight. In the early games, you know, Gabby Bonlahor scored a screamer against Blackburn, I think. We beat them three one in the, uh, the second or third game of the season, and he, he turned Salgado on the edge of the box and with a, with a brilliant Cruyff turn and and uh, curled it in the top corner. That, so that was nice because Villa Park was buzzing and I'm saying, God, that, you know, this is what I was looking for. This is the thing that <laughs> thing that I had. You know, I was I was determined to prove myself at Rangers, and uh, you know, thankfully I did there. And I thought, right. Oh, you know, we're, we're going to be third in the league or second at this moment in the early games. Uh, but the Chelsea game was the highlight, you know, to go to Stamford Bridge and, and um, it, you know, thankfully at that time, Villas-Boas, I think, was the gaffer and he, 
he left Frank Lampard out, which I, I thought was was definitely a boost for us. Was there a lot, do you remember that shisha pipe thing that came out? And Stephen Ireland had been been spotted smoking a shisha pipe or something. And you, I think you played dumb and said, "I don't know what a shisha pipe is. I think, I think you know, you can blow bubbles with it or something." And uh, but Ireland, I think that might have been Ireland's best game. It, it, Stephen had had a, he almost like it had an effortless talent, didn't he? You know, he just um, seemed to glide through over the pitch at times, and um, we're all we were always looking for. Stephen to go that extra step and be like go and be player of the year or something, you know, be, be the player of the year. I mean, in, in the whole of England, you know, not just at Aston Villa. That game against Chelsea, it, it was absolutely mercurial. Uh, uh, we we had a, a, a team that day that you know we we would have loved to have kept that consistency, but we a we never uh, had. The, Probably the same eleven on the field for so many games, and and uh, be we just never um, you know got enough victories together to uh, you know to, to cement a confidence and, and a belief. But we did we did have a lot of draws. I think we 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 know about sixteen or seventeen draws, and there was some of those moments where we we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. In certain games, when you know we, we had a lead in those, as, as you know, one point to three points is rocket shit up the table, and it, it's still the same in the Premier League uh, today as we speak. Without wishing to open up our wounds, what what does it feel when when the 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 halt end and the and the stadium turns, Alex? Is it is it the kind of cliched want the want the ground to open up and swallow you up? Well, listen, I I like any other manager coach know that um, when the, the, your own crowd goes against you it's it's one of the most horrible feelings in the world um, there's absolutely no getting away from that it's, it's how you deal with it and uh, I, I just thought you know I'm, I'm not in control of that, that until I can start giving them a team that they, the, the fans are going to love to watch or a team and, and certainly, most importantly, a team that's going to uh, keep winning. So that is what you have to do with, with, in terms of supporters. As I said, the Rangers fans, the guy said, yeah, you get an underwhelming welcome. And I said, well, it's up to me to prove to the fans that I'm the right man for the job. Um, and that's that was the, what was in my head when I, in, in the early moments of the Aston Villa, Job. I think after that Bolton game, I think Randy and Paul put out a statement, kind of, you know, I don't know, what's it called? The dreaded vote of confidence, is it called, I think. I think they put out a statement saying, kind of, Alex is our man. Um, but I think they put till the end of the season. When you when you yeah. read that, when you read that as a manager, or when you're told that as a manager, what what do you feel? Do you kind of roll your eyes and think, okay, then? No, I yeah, I, I, I just say, what will be, will be. and and But, you know, if I... It, if I can do everything I can to summon up all my experience, or, or um, you, you know, to to try and keep players playing to to a level, to at least the, the the least thing that everybody can give you is that they they knock their pan in, you know, they they don't stop until the final whistle, and you know, the, these are the things I think which saw us through in the end. I know we we had a a horrible last game against Norwich. That was a, a little bit difficult, but the, any manager and coach, the, I think every one of them, their, their key goal is that they want to see their own fans being happy. And, and it, it was a bit uncomfortable the whole season and um, there were some good moments. It was It's, it's a great and huge club. And um, I, as I said, I don't regret having taken the job. But I think, I think I'd probably. Well, maybe you never know. Sliding doors. Uh, maybe I went on to have a, a, a successful career somewhere else. Uh, but uh, I, I felt in my head. I said, "Look, how can I turn this down?" Um, and maybe when 
I saw the parameters. Uh, I had a chance to say, well, listen, I'm, forget it. It's, I just see it as an impossible task. And uh, But the way that Alec McLeish is built is um, he loves a challenge. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've just mentioned the... Uh... You mentioned the, the Norwich game. Did you know that when that game had finished and that when you were going back into Bodymore Heath on the Monday morning after that, do you get a sense that, that the axe is going to fall? Well, I, you know, I looked at the league table, I looked at the financial table that, that I was given task and I thought, right, I've, I've actually got a, a good case to, to be saying, well, I've done everything you asked. And uh, I don't see why, <laughs> you know, and you, you, I could probably get a lawyer on it, but it, it was, yeah, I, I thought there was going to be talks. And, um, it, you know, I think that maybe, well, the board don't like toxic atmospheres and at football matches. And if they're getting it in the neck, then there's only one loser. And, and that's the manager, you know, who, uh, they're not going to sack every player. It's they're going to um, chop manager. And yeah, I, I thought it'd probably be be talks. But you know, when you think back, it to, you say, right, wait a minute, lawyer, get talk to them and say. But it, for me, you know, it was a bit of a relief as well, to be honest, when I went in to speak to Paul, and we 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 agreed on um, me leaving the club and that. You know, I, I think when I walked out of Villa Park uh, or out of the training ground, I uh, I felt relieved, and you know, my, my head was clear. My I wasn't having the anxiety in my stomach anymore, um, and you know, I thought right, I gave it a whirl and I tried my best. We had a lot of things against us as this whole pod, podcast that we've had would uh, testify to that. So um, without prying too much, I should imagine the conversation with Paul, from my experience of knowing Paul Fortler, I should imagine he, he phrased it quite delicately. Yeah, yeah, it was a thing. It was amicable. And Paul, we had a good relationship. You know, I did try and uh, ask him for two or three players in January and um, he politely declined because of, again, you know, trying to, to get the, the money the wage is down to a certain level, but before by the end of the season, um, and and uh, you know he, he said at this moment in time we, we can't get players like that. You know it was it was um, Sigurdsson. We 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 felt we needed some you know kind of craft in midfield, and again it was players from the war room. But um, you know we we had to soldier on with a with the current great players, some of the great players that we had, and also you know, filtering in some youngsters. So we're eight years on, kind of, what would you regard, and I'm going to ask you to kind of really kind of dig deep into your memory banks now, for the kind of best, well, probably, no, for the strangest or funniest moment of your, of your time at Villa, something that offered a bit of light relief away from the, uh, you know, the constant pressures and strains. We had... Um... You know, we had some people in to speak to us now and again, and uh, the, the Bank of England top man. Oh, Mervyn King. Mervyn came in, and uh, he was addressing the players, and he said, um, you know, how, how many people have signed a cheque for £10,000? And a lot of the players put their hands up, and then how many people have signed a cheque for a million pounds, and nobody put their hands up? He says, how many have signed a cheque for... Ten million pounds. What happened was Mervyn was obviously talking about his job and the, the responsibility he had, and he he actually ended up telling them that he'd signed a check for like a hundred million or something. So you know, when I just think about that now, and I look back, it's, it's, that's chicken feed nowadays, isn't it, for the Premier League players? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say Randy Lerner sat at the back of the room and he didn't put his hand up when he'd been asked to sign a cheque for, <laughs> for that many No, I was, actually, I was actually just kind of making it into a fresh joke. But we we had, um, you know, top guys and we speak to the guys and try and inspire them a wee, a wee bit. And it, it was part of my life and um, I don't regret it. And 
you know, I, I, I think against all the, the, you know, the obstacles that were in front of me, you know, I'm, I'm, at times I'm saying I'm, pr- I'm pretty proud of managing to keep Villa up. And just finally, my, my one, one final recollection was, I remember bumping into you on a train down to London at the start of, it might have been the start of the 2013-14 season. I think Villa were playing away at Arsenal under Paul Lambert. And I think somehow, by complete coincidence, you'd uh, arranged to take your good lady wife to the, the theatre or something in London on that day. And you're on a train full of um, a train full <laughs> of Villa fans. I don't know whether you recall it. Uh, but I just thought, and it, was, it, it, it wasn't hostile. It was just good, good natured friendly banter and that's kind of it's a memory that stuck with me to be honest yeah yeah that was good and yeah listen I think Villa fans as the years go past they will be thinking that guy didn't do so badly after all it's something that although it was a challenge and it was something that kind of you know kind of that there were lots of hurdles in the way I suppose it's a bit of a cliche Alex but I suppose it's it's character building isn't it yeah (laughs) (laughs) Or, um, as, as Red Adair once said, firefighting. <laughs> Listen, there's been a lot of that over uh, the last 15 years or so. Um, and, you know, difficult when you think any of the managers in the Premier League now will tell you that it, without uh, a budget, they, they will struggle. Well, I did a lot of firefighting. I did it at Rangers. I did it. And after a, a while, it kind of <laughs> gets in your head. Um, and you know you, you get a, a, a wee bit of uh, time off, then you think, right, okay, well, I'm going back in. And um, I, I would like, I think I've got something to offer. I would like to go backstage and uh, possibly sporting director and, and help. Somehow, I've never ever really had a chance to get money to spend and say, right, let's go for him. Let's let's do that. It's always been kind of, as I said, it. To you about five minutes ago, a little bit of firefighting, and it, it, you know the the old the old head nips a wee bit, for, you know when it, when it has to be that kind of scenario year in year out. Well, listen, it's been a real pleasure, Alex. Thanks for giving us so much of your time. I do hope that you're going to get be fielding calls from Aberdeen and Rangers and Scotland and Birmingham City Carling, Carling Cup podcast as well, just so if people are taking you on a trip down memory lane, it's not yeah. all kind of the misery and doom and gloom that I've uh, <laughs> that I've invited on you this afternoon. But listen, no, well, listen, I think we, we got a few facts out and it was good for people to, it would be good for people to hear all that, you know, because maybe there's young, young ones that, that will be tuning in now, you know, they, they weren't quite, you know, aware of everything. Uh, and it's good education, you know, um, and I don't, as I said, don't regret it. Going from Birmingham to Villa, I now, I now see that um, it's every bit as rivalry as Rangers and Celtic. No, well, listen, thank you so much for your time. And um, just wanted to say to, to you, kind of, you and yours, stay safe during these weird and worrying times. But really appreciate appreciate you taking time to, to come and join us and, and tell your story. As you say, Paul. People's health, there's, there's worse things in the world. The, the, the health is the most important thing. So everybody stay safe. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa. Up the villa.